So today is day number one of trial number one involving a defendant who attacked the U.S. Capitol on January 6th. Let's talk about how jury selection is going and what we can expect this trial to look like. Because justice matters. Hey all, Glenn Kirshner here. So the first trial of a defendant who is charged in the January 6th attack on the U.S. Capitol just began. The defendant's name is Guy Reffitt, and he's charged with five felony counts. The trial's being conducted in Washington, D.C., in D.C. Federal District Court, and it's being presided over by Judge Dabney Friedrich. Uh, I attended day one today, jury selection, and jury selection will continue for another day or two. And I want to talk a little bit about how jury selection is going, but first, um, let's talk a little bit about the case itself. Here is how the Washington Post is reporting it today. Headline, Guns, Radicalization, and a Father's Alleged Threat, First January 6th Trial Begins. And that article reads in part, Jury selection started Monday for the trial of a purported Texas recruiter for the right-wing anti-government group known as the Three Percenters, charged in the January 6, 2021 attack on the Capitol. Guy Wesley Reffitt, 49, of Wiley, Texas, is the first Capitol breach defendant to go to trial. Reffitt faces five felony counts to which he's pleaded not guilty. They include obstructing an official proceeding of Congress, trespassing at the Capitol while carrying a holstered semi-automatic handgun, interfering with police in a riot, and witness tampering after prosecutors say he threatened his teenage children not to turn him into the authorities. And his children will testify at this trial as prosecution witnesses, and some of what we expect to hear from Reffitt's son includes the following. When Trump invited supporters in December to a wild rally in Washington on January 6th, Reffitt's son warned the FBI that his father was going to do some serious damage to federal lawmakers. On the drive there, Reffitt, the defendant, talked about dragging those people out of the Capitol by their ankles and installing a new government. So that gives you a flavor of some of the expected testimony in this trial. Now, um, let me set the stage a little bit. There's a picture of the federal courtroom in which the case is being tried. That is an authorized picture that was released by the court itself because Photographs and audio, video recordings are prohibited in federal courthouses. And Judge Friedrich uh, asked 27 questions of the potential jurors, the prospective jurors. Frankly, I was surprised she asked so few questions given the nature of this case. You know, I tried uh, RICO cases in that very courthouse and our juror questionnaires typically ran between about 100 and 120 questions, but Judge Friedrich managed to boil it down to just 27 questions. And for those of you unfamiliar with jury selection, um, the questions that are typically asked and were asked by Judge Friedrich include questions like, um, do any of you live or work near the U.S. Capitol, that is the crime scene, do any of you have direct or indirect connections with any of the events of January 6th? Uh, have you followed media accounts about what happened on January 6th? Have you heard or read anything about this defendant, Guy Reffitt? Do you have any strong feelings about what happened on January 6th? Sounds like a loaded question, right? But the judge follows that question up with, if you do have strong feelings, would those strong feelings make it difficult for you to sit as a fair and impartial juror 
and decide this case based only on the evidence you hear introduced during the course of the trial. Judge Friedrich asked if the potential jurors knew any of the, the prosecutors or the defense attorney or any of the court staff members. And then she asked the jurors whether they could apply certain legal principles. For example, she asked them, can you apply the extremely high evidentiary standard of beyond a reasonable doubt? Or would you have any problem applying that standard? Similarly, can you presume the defendant innocent? Because every defendant enjoys a presumption of innocence. So at the beginning of the trial, you must presume the defendant innocent and you cannot vote guilty unless and until the evidence proves his guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. She also asked the potential jurors if the defendant decided not to testify, as is his absolute constitutional right, can you promise not to hold that against him? Can you abide by my legal instructions that a defendant need not testify and you can draw no negative inferences against him if he exercises his constitutional right not to testify? She asked the jurors, if they have such strong feelings about guns, about firearms, that it would make it difficult for them to sit as a fair and impartial jury in this case, given that there will be testimony about the defendant potentially possessing a firearm. And then Judge Friedrich went on to ask um, a series of fairly standard juror questions like, um, are you a lawyer or have you ever attended law school? Are you a police officer or a member of law enforcement of any kind? Have you ever been accused of or charged with or convicted of a crime? Have you ever been a victim to a crime or a witness to a crime? Do you have any prior jury experience? Do you have any health concerns or physical limitations that would make it difficult for you to perform jury service, etc.? And over the course of the day, the judge qualified about 10 jurors and she announced that she'd like to qualify a total of about 40 jurors. And then from that pool of 40, the parties will pick 12 jurors and a handful of alternates. So jury selection is expected to last about three days. And then it looks like they'll probably move into opening statements on or about Thursday. Now, once the prosecutors begin presenting evidence, we pretty much know how they're going to go about proving their case. Here's what the Washington Post says about that. Assistant U.S. Attorneys Jeff Nessler and Risa Burkauer, and I should say Jeff Nessler was a colleague of mine. He was in the homicide section when I was a federal homicide prosecutor at the D.C. U.S. Attorney's Office, and he is a very strong attorney. I don't know Ms. Burkauer. Assistant U.S. Attorneys Jeff Nessler and Risa Burkauer in court filings have said the government will set the stage for jurors using a half-hour video montage of the riot as it progressed. They will also include at least 40 minutes of surveillance video of Refit, the defendant, police, and rioters, and Vice President Mike Pence, and 31 minutes of panoramic video recorded by Refit's helmet camera. You know, friends, rarely do prosecutors get to play a video where the defendant recorded his own criminal conduct on his helmet camera. But I think what may end up being the most interesting question is, how will Refit defend the case? Here is the question as it was posed by that same Washington Post article. It's unclear whether Refit's defense will cite his political views or reasons for going to the Capitol. So will the defendant claim that he was doing what President Donald Trump told him to do? Because Donald Trump told him and the others on January 6th at the pre-insurrection pep rally, that their vote had been stolen. 
that their election had been stolen, that their president was being stolen from them, and that they needed to march up to the Capitol and stop what was going on in that building. And if they didn't fight like hell, they wouldn't have a country anymore. And if that is how Refit chooses to defend the case, what are the factual implications? What are the legal implications? What are what I would call the jury nullification implications? And then what are the implications for any future trial against Donald Trump for inciting the insurrection? Well, friends, I will tackle those questions in tomorrow's Justice Matters video. What does it mean if these insurrection defendants start to blame their conduct on Donald Trump, claiming he told them to do precisely what they did? Might that actually move matters in the direction of justice writ large. Because justice matters. Friends, as always, please stay safe, please stay tuned, and I look forward to talking with you all again tomorrow.